one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of our Lord. Please pray with me. God, please give me the words you want me to say, and please help all of us to hear what you want us to hear. Amen. Um, this is the third time I'm giving this sermon, and at, on this occasion, I have my daughters with me, so they're very familiar with that prayer. It's one that I used all the time as a children's minister before I taught Sunday school. Um, quite often, I got the most challenging questions of theology after teaching the little four-year-olds and five-year-olds. Their minds were an open book, and it was amazing. When I first started to plan out this sermon, I intended to confess to you all that it's my first and then my sister reminded me that um, she actually heard my first sermon. I was five. She was two. I pulled her into my bedroom and handed her a picture book to use as a hymnal. And I began to preach. And she had no patience and no tolerance for my bright, brilliant words. And started singing Jesus Loves Me right in the middle of it. We got into a fight. My mom separated us. And that was my last real attempt at a sermon until today. Um, that experience aside, this is the first time uh, this morning um, that I've done this. I've gotten up in front of a congregation, put on a robe, and preached on specific lessons. And I'm a little nervous because on the same day that Pastor Kyle um, invited me to have this opportunity, I got an, an email with a video attachment that a friend sent me. She was, she was helping to keep me humble. This was a pastor in Arizona. Um, he has a lot of videos on YouTube. He's not shy. He wants a lot of people to know his words. And in this particular video, his sermon was about the, the fallacy that we in the United States are perpetuating by allowing women the right to vote. And he was explaining that scripture says women don't have a right to authority, and he also took that a step further, that we don't have a right to pick who is in authority. I looked at my mother, who was watching it with me, and I said, where did he go to seminary? Oh my gosh. It took me one minute to find his church's website and find that he proudly states he didn't go to seminary, he didn't go to college, he read the Bible from front to back, decided he was a pastor, and started asking for money and opened his own church. Now, here's the thing, I'm, I'm 40 years old, this is the second career for me, and over the past five years that I've been discussing with everyone my call to ministry, no one told me this was an option. <laughs> That I could just read through the whole Bible, decide to be a pastor, and ask for money? Um, I called my mom when, after I watched that video, and, and I'd been preparing my sermon. I called her up and I said, Mom, I've decided I'm a pastor now. I've written a sermon. Please give me money to start a church. <laughs> and she said, uh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I asked some of my friends earlier this week, and they just shook their heads at me and told me to keep working. And that's the thing, is that in the ELCA, as most other denominations, um, we don't do things that way. Being ordained as a pastor is an invitation to the head of the table, of this table, to preside over 
the meal. And the thing is that I have been in seminary for one week, and there's now one thing I know for sure, I really, I don't know very much. I have a lot to learn. I do not belong at the head of the table, and it would be very embarrassing. I don't even need to read this parable of Jesus to know that it would be very embarrassing if I decided to set myself up here. Because it wouldn't take long for someone to say, if you don't belong there, move. I have four years of seminary ahead of me. I've taken one week. I'm working on being accepted as a candidate. It's all a process. And I have um, an internship. And then maybe, maybe, I will be ordained. And on that day, if that day comes that I am presiding over the meal, it will probably be the first day of my life I have no words, just tears. Most of us aren't honored to be at the head of the table, but in the ELCA, we are all welcome at the table. Being welcome at the table was a novel concept to the Pharisees Jesus was meeting with in this passage. According to the Cultural World of Jesus by John J. Pilch, accepting an invitation to dinner in the ancient Mediterranean world obligated a guest to return the favor. I do you a favor, you do me a favor, endlessly. This basic rule of behavior guided every host in drawing up a guest list. Inviting people who cannot return the favor is viewed as social suicide. Jesus was turning this cultural practice upside down. He and his host knew that this social practice actually went against the Torah, against the law, which these Pharisees used as a judge of everyone. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are many passages about welcoming the stranger. Even though I'm not educated about preaching and homiletics and I have a long way to go, I do know a lot about welcoming the stranger. For most of my life, um, both as a child and now, I've been working with refugees. It began when I was six, and the church where my father was a pastor sponsored a family fleeing the Soviet Union. As an adult, I was director of the local Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services affiliate here in Fort Worth. And a big part of my job was going around and speaking to churches about helping refugees resettle here. I used this passage from Hebrews a lot, but it's actually all through the Bible. And both the Greek and the Hebrew have words for welcome and stranger. But in this passage in Hebrews, both of those concepts are wrapped up in one verb. This one word, verb means welcoming the stranger. It is such a key concept that it has its own word. There's good reason for it to be repeated here in the letter to the Hebrews, directed to the people that should already know all about it. Almost all of us fail. At the beginning of this year, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees reported 21.3 million refugees living in camps. There are at least that many now. How is this happening? How are there any refugees living in tents without food and medicine in a world of 2.2 billion Christians? It's probably because we have newspapers, TV news, Facebook, and blogs constantly telling us they are strangers, and strangers hurt people. There's exactly one way that we can overcome this fear of strangers, and that is the exact same way that the Pharisees could overcome their dislike of the poor, and it is the exact same way that the original recipients of this letter could obey. And that is by carrying the gospel here and in our focus at all times. If we walk around with gospel glasses on our faces, we have no fear, because we know that Jesus faced imprisonment, Jesus faced torture, and Jesus faced execution. Not just for our sins, but for the sins of the strangers. He died for absolutely everyone, and then he overcame that death. When you know here that you cannot die, you can welcome the stranger, you can remember those who are in prison. You can remember those who are tortured. And you can do it all without fear. I realize that I'm kind of preaching to the choir here in this room. I've only been a part of this church since last November, but I already know that the green sheet is full of welcome and invitations. The church welcomes many strangers, including me and my family. So do you ever wonder if you have entertained angels? I wonder that. I wonder about it a lot. 
When I was 10 years old, some members of our church learned that there was a woman's group home just a couple blocks away from the church. They began volunteering there and asked my father as the pastor to reach out to the staff about the possibility of welcoming these ladies at our church. The women represented a broad range of IQs and physical challenges, but they were excited and eager to attend the church. And after a short time, my father designed a class for them on the sacraments. Everyone remembers that first Sunday that those women were invited to the table not just for a blessing, but to partake of the meal. There was one woman in particular who was very bright, very sharp, but she had no, she had very little uh, muscle ability and her arms, her legs, even her head had a brace on the back of her wheelchair because she had a hard time holding it up. And as she was wheeled up to the communion rail, she used every last inch of her muscular ability and flung herself onto the kneeling pad at the rail. She slung herself over the rail to hold herself up, and she put her hands out like this. She knew the honor, the honor that it was to be welcome at that table. She felt that invitation, and she wanted to be a part of it, just like everybody else. I wonder if she was an angel. A few years ago, my husband and I welcomed a Syrian Muslim man to live with us for a time while applying for asylum here in the U.S. One week, he attended church with us and was overcome by the experience of communion. He wasn't baptized, but recognized that it was a big deal and started meeting with our Episcopal priest. He was baptized and came to the table fully cognizant of the gospel in a way that only someone who has been tortured can feel it. I now experience communion in a completely different way after having known him. And I wonder, did I entertain an angel without knowing it? I do believe that we encounter angels, but I know that I am an idealist. I look for miracles and angels everywhere. God, in his infinite wisdom, provided for me a partner in this life, my husband, who is as much a realist as I am an idealist. He is an engineer that reads physics books for fun. He doesn't have imaginary friends, and he doesn't exaggerate or embellish stories. And yet, of the two of us, he's the one that has met an angel. Seven years ago, he had to have surgery to remove a non-cancerous mass from his liver. It wasn't cancerous, but it was still really scary. And he knew it was going to be a very invasive surgery. And as big and powerful and strong and brilliant of a person he is, he was terrified. And as they wheeled him out of the room where I was standing, he had his eyes squeezed shut, praying silently. And he prayed to God, please send me an angel. Please send someone to be over me, with me through this surgery. When he opened his eyes, there was an angel. And she said to him, God's hands will be on the surgeon and I will be with you all the way until the end. And just like that, there was no more fear. He was in the hospital for a week. It took him over a month to be able to get back to work. Just walking was a big challenge. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he's six foot two, I'm foot, five foot tall, and I had to help him walking around the house. But he wasn't afraid for any of it. It's a fact that in this world we will see and hear scary things. We will be called upon to experience pain and to work hard. It's inevitable. But we carry the gospel here. We carry the gospel in our vision. The gospel is what brings us here to this table every week. The gospel is what helps this congregation do outreach to the community, to work in prison ministry, and many other things that I'm just learning about. The gospel equips all of us to welcome the stranger. And who knows? We may be entertaining angels without knowing it. Amen.